Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. This podcast is devoted to exploring the science of rejuvenation, uncovering the most trusted experts, the must-have products, innovations, and technology in the field of vitality, aesthetics, new beauty, and cosmetic enhancement. Dr. Cara McDonald, welcome to Ageless by Rescue. As I said, you've been on my hit list to get on the episode uh, on the show, and I saw you do a really beautiful, compassionate, and very informative um, Instagram live the other day on the topic of the hour, Linda Evangelista, and what is a par um, as an adverse reaction to fat freezing. Well, thank you very much for having me and inviting me on the show. I'm very happy to chat to you. We've we've met a few times because you are one of um, the media uh, favourites uh, as a spokesperson for the aesthetics industry. And in my introduction, I, I mentioned one of the things I love about you is that you really understand the end consumer as a woman, as um, a, a mother, as a, a practitioner. And one of the things that you're most renowned for is, you know, um, good education for your clients and also making them feel happy and comfortable about the choices that they make. So in this case, which is, you know, obviously now a, a tabloid explosion, the background um, is, and, uh, and I'll get you to kind of pepper it, jump in at any time, is that Linda Evangelista, who's a 90s supermodel, you know, regarded as one of the most beautiful women in the world, um, had treatment to fat freeze on her face and her body. And instead of the fat freezing procedure working to eliminate fat, her body has had an adverse and opposite reaction and produced more fat cells. Is that what's happening? Yes. So thank you for your lovely introduction also. Um, I certainly um, see myself as an advocate for consumers and that's my passion to educate uh, people to be able to make good choices in their treatments, um, especially within the skin, skincare and um, aesthetic industry. And there's, there's a real need for that because it's largely unregulated uh, throughout many countries, including Australia. So we need to make sure that people are educated the right way. So Linda Evangelista's story, and, you know, don't get me wrong, um, I, I don't have any inside information on this other than what's been in the media and in her posts, but she publicly um, posted on Instagram last week, I think, that she had suffered from a condition that we uh, call paradoxical adipose hyperplasia. So PAH, or paradoxical adipose hyperplasia, it's a bit of a mouthful. What it means is paradoxical is that like the opposite to what you expect. So it's the unexpected um, reverse reaction. Adipose is fat and hyperplasia means increase or growth. So it basically just means unexpected fat growth. And um, what she published was that she had had um, procedures done, I believe in 2017, and instead of shrinking away the fat cells, which was what she was expecting and what the procedure was designed to do, she had this adverse reaction, um, which has become probably since then a little more publicised and well-known. Um, but it The is adverse known... reaction has become more publicised yeah. and well-known. So yeah. it, is well, it is known that this is a it's, possible... It's certainly known. And, and I think any consumer now, if they were doing research, would probably come across it. Um, and certainly should um, be made aware of it by their practitioner, absolutely. But um, at, at, according to her claims, um, which have also been published, she had multiple areas treated and was not made aware of this possible complication. And so it tends to occur um, after this um, procedure we call cryo cry cryolipolysis, which is fat freezing. So cryo meaning cold, lipolysis meaning fat breakdown. And cryolipolysis is, is a procedure that we um, uh, use to uh, cool down the fat cells 
to a minus 10 degrees and fat cells are more sensitive than say the skin cells or the nerves or the blood vessels. So if that um, area is cooled down to about minus 10 degrees between sort of some plates in a sort of suction device, then the much like when you freeze water, um, it expands, the fat cells expand and rupture. And then the body's uh, immune system comes in and clears them away. And so each treatment you have, you get fat, a reduction in the fat cells. I've now, had this, this treatment. I want to tell you that I had this treatment six years ago and it is super effective. Like this thing works. It's mm. uncomfortable, definitely. It's not kind of like a minor cosmetic treatment. As you said, you know, it gets really cold to freeze the fat mm. and you're doing something that you know the alternative is what surgery or um i guess liposuction so you know it's a hugely popular treatment too and i i believe that from all the fat reduction treatments that are available on the market cool sculpting is about 50 percent of the treatments that are done so it's very you know, popular. i think it was the first one available uh, mm. of our kind of non-surgical body contouring or certainly the big one with a with a name and um, became popular. And certainly if you talk to someone about non-surgical fat reduction, like the brand name of Cool Sculpting is often used. Um, and that is that is just a particular brand. And um, but it is it is known, it is effective. Um, it's generally um, very safe, uh, very low risk. And removes those risks that traditional liposuction were yeah, always associated with. Yeah, exactly. And those so. risks are a general anaesthetic for most people or large amounts of local anaesthetic, um, all the surgical risks, complications, things called seromas, which are collections of fluid you can get after liposuction, downtime, the need to use compression garments. So you can see in this sort of day and age of, um, you know, promotion of perfectionism and body awareness, social media, these kinds of things are extremely popular. You can do it in your lunchtime and um, not have any downtime, relatively low cost, depending on how many treatments you need, but they're only appropriate for certain areas in certain people. It's not so for everyone. Talking about, um, going back to Linda Evangelista, she had it in multiple areas and um, one of the things that I, I read is that you might not know that you're going to have an adverse reaction for quite some time. And in fact, you might think that the adverse reaction is A, you've put on weight, so you, it masks any mm -hmm. kind of uh, disfiguration or the uh, paradoxical side of it, which is that you've grown fat cells. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that you might think that it hasn't worked for you so where the fat has come in you think oh well you know cool sculpting didn't work for me so it's yeah. not immediate is it this um no trigger? It, it's usually um from my understanding around the six month mark that it becomes quite obvious and it can be sort of between three and nine months and um i believe that you know the diagnostic criteria would be that it's in the shape of the applicator so it's it's specific to where the cryolipolysis was performed and also that there hasn't been any significant change in weight or BMI over that same period. So mm -hmm. if that person has gained 10 kilos over six months, um, it's harder, definitely harder to diagnose. And it's been kind of proposed that actually maybe it's a survival mechanism. You know, there are um, certain genetic traits that make it more common, certain groups they've seen it more in. And, you know, one question is, you know, are some people designed to survive in very cold weather? It's for the survival of the human species that it actually toughens you up by if you've been in severe freezing circumstances, if you grow more fat, you are more likely to survive and um, insulate yourself. So you can see that kind of makes sense, although it's obviously a very small proportion of the population. I'm not sure if it's more common in Eskimos or not. So how many, What what is the uh, frequency of PAH uh, occurring? You know, what studies do we have globally? What studies do we have locally? And have you ever experienced it in your practice? So we don't have cryolipolysis in our practice. Um, so, you know, I want to put that out there that although I, you know, obviously know a bit about it, we don't perform it. So I don't have any firsthand experience of this complication in my patients. 
Um, the statistics are variable as with many of these kind of fairly rare complications. The early studies were suggesting that it was about one in 4,000 people, which is very, very low. Mm -hmm. But some more recent studies and um, practice analysis have shown uh, a rate of up to one in 138 or so. Yeah, that's what I've read, which is quite 0. high. 0.7%. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, you could say less than 1%, less than one in 100 but certainly from a practitioner point of view, that would be something that I would want my patients to know about and accept the risk of before they went ahead. And of course, as you said, if it's very, if it's effective, it's very effective. Um, so, you know, people, it might not put people off, but it might mean they go more slowly. They do it a smaller area to test it or something along those lines. Now, you're a doctor and you work in a practice with other doctors, but a yes. lot of these aesthetic treatments are performed un not uh, under medical uh, advice or supervision. They're performed by clinicians mm -hmm. and it's a different, certainly they might have the same training for the particular apparatus, but they don't necessarily have the same training or the same ability to uh, possibly inform the patient of the risks and side effects. My One of the things that I really am curious to explore with you is what is the role of the client or the consumer in availing themselves of the best kind of education before they book in for an aesthetic treatment of any kind, really? And what is the role of the doctor, the practitioner, the clinic? Because this you know, the conversation around consenting and uh, advising seems to be the more important conversation to have here, not a one-off adverse effect or one in 100 uh, adverse effect, because there's adversity and there's, you know, the, the chance for problems in nearly every single treatment. There's, you know, so whose responsibility is it? It's a really good question because it's very difficult in this industry, which spans between um, estheticians or beauticians, dermal clinicians who, you know, have a degree, um, and then medical practitioners, which range from nurses um, through to general practi medical practitioners, specialist medical practitioners, and everything in between. And many of the clinics in this space are, are operated and owned by people who are business people. They're not um, trained at all in the medical field. So within the medical industry, we are highly regulated by a body called APRA. And um, we have to reapply for our registration every year. Um, if we have complaints against us, that would go to APRA. They determine whether or not we are uh, fit to practice in our area and whether we should be able to maintain our registration. Um, outside of that, there are procedures that can be performed. Um, lasers, for example, many lasers can be performed by non-medical non-ARPA registered practitioners, which is you know, a huge topic of debate. And um, then other sort of less invasive or less risky procedures such as microneedling um, and, you know, more in the kind of cosmetic, uh, medical grade peels, facial treatments, light treatments, those sorts of things. So, I mean, it does come down, unfortunately, to the practitioner's integrity a lot of the time. And... If you're regulated by APRA, then you probably have at least some degree of fear that you, you know, have a certain expectation to consent properly because that's part of our regulations. We need to, we have to tell people about serious complications and common complications and anything that you think that might affect that person's life social medical well-being so that's on us as medical practitioners to ensure that now 
that does not mean it's always done. And I, I think dermal fillers is a great example because they are so common. So many people are getting them and many people are getting them um, done in all sorts of environments, but it does have to be a medical practitioner, at least in Australia. So it needs to be at least a nurse or doctor to perform that procedure. But I've seen many, many people that have had dermal fillers elsewhere. And when I go through the full consent form, they're shocked. They're shocked at the possible risks and side effects of that procedure that they weren't previously. And should we be shocked? I mean, told about. I mean, should we be shocked? Is that what we need? Because you were saying before that the doctors are operating under fear, which is what would hopefully encourage them to be completely above board, to be absolutely following the advice uh, and sharing all the possible risks and side effects. But should the I mean, consumer be afraid and and from that point, from that perspective, do their own investigation? Look, absolutely. And I think that people go into things with no idea, especially, you know, and I'm I'm not ageist, I'm clearly old, but um people don't have a very good risk assessment ability when they're younger and they're far more prepared to take risks. That's a genetic factor that that meant that you know the young people will go out fight the beast bring home the food whatever we don't have a fear factor before we're responsible usually for other people which is generally our children and so this age group you know often they don't ask the risks they don't research the risks and i'm obviously generalizing here but um but linda evangelista is you know in her 50s and so you know, and I, I would also say I wasn't consented correctly when I, I had cool sculpting. I wasn't mm. consented correctly, I would say, the first time I had injectables. Um, certainly I go to a very conservative um, doctor Safe. now for all of my, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, very specific uh, about what treatments I have and I do the research, but I'm wondering, would my mum get consented properly would she would she ask the questions and and so you know when I launched Ageless as a magazine as a podcast one of the things I really wanted to do is create a, a, an opportunity for consumers there's a lot of b2b conversation a lot of b2b media I'm not b2b I'm b to consumer business to consumer and I wanted to have these conversations with the experts not me I, I'm not a medical expert um I have no business to tell you what to try or what not to try beyond skincare, really. And that would be from, you know, what I enjoy using and what I get good results from. But the real experts, such as yourself, such as the formulators, such as the surgeons, there needs to be a collective, safe, reliable forum for consumers to come to. And media is really hard. It's it's really hard for a normal person to get this information. So where do you where do you go what do you suggest other than ageless of course <laughs> yeah ageless of course um it's I completely agree with you and this is why I'm in this space because it's very very frustrating as someone who does have expertise and experience and knowledge and education to see where people are getting their information from it is so depressing um, that the misinformation out there is being fed to people through you know media influences tiktok people's friends you know the number of people that you know choose their skincare based on a tiktok trend or a friend's advice you know i mean even that if you think about it no wonder people are wasting billions of dollars on the wrong stuff um are there enough experts? Are there enough educated people for people to get their advice from? Well, maybe not. And that can be one of the problems. But as a consumer, as I said, I think sometimes they just uh, don't care, are prepared to take risks, don't, don't think about it, don't think it will happen to them, um, all those things that are common in certain age groups. As we get older, I think we're much more discerning and more focused on our own safety and we probably are more likely to choose quality over quantity, so to speak. I would like and to think so, but I, I, there's still a lot of evidence that it's bamboozling, first of all. There's a lot of contradictory information 
And um, I always think of it like the bad boyfriend effect. Like, you know, he's, he's a bad guy. He's shown you all the red flags, but on you march, on you march. And I think the same is And true. you don't One- know what you don't know. You yes. don't know. You, you really don't know what you don't know. And that's where, to me, it comes back to practitioners. To me, it's, it's the practitioner's responsibility. Unfortunately, some of them don't know what they don't know either. And that's, that's where it gets a bit scary because there's no minimum training. There's no minimum training required to inject a syringe of filler into someone's lips. And there's no minimum training required. Now, there's, there's advice and, re- and suggestions, but there's no actual qualification needed to do that. So in my opinion, it does come back to the practitioners. I think it's their responsibility to do the best thing for their patient or client. And, you know, often the best thing is saying no. Often the best thing is talking about alternate treatment options. Often the best thing is saying, I am not actually skilled enough to do what you need. Um, This is outside my circle of competence, but that will build trust, that will build rapport, and that will actually um, turn that person into a better clinician with a better clientele and a better business and a better job satisfaction long-term. But a lot of people are scared to say no. They um, either look at, you know, the opportunity of making that sale, so to speak, or else they don't want to let down their, you know, guard of not knowing what they're talking about. And um what yeah, about just... uh, on the subject of um, fat reduction? Because, you know, um, liposuction is the number one cosmetic procedure in Australia still. And um, so obviously, we, you know, we're coming out of a pandemic. Weight gain is a huge topic. and <laughs> We all need it. <laughs> yeah. And, the, uh, you know, the rising obesity in the population hasn't gone away as an issue. So um, there's going to be more and more demand for surgical and non-surgical uh, fat reduction, weight loss, spot treatments. So in the event that, you know, you're still not put off by this story and you are interested in having, what are some of the safe kind of questions and what would you recommend to your clients to do, even if you don't have cool sculpting at your practice, what would be the um, kind of the checklist to go through if you're still interested in having surgical or uh, well, let's say non-surgical fat reduction? Yeah, look, I think the first thing is um, to try and get a recommendation for a practitioner. I think, you know, preferably somebody you know or someone you trust or, you know, a trusted advice. Unfortunately, you know, Google reviews, I, I mean, I can reel off a list of people I know that, you know, have doctored all their own Google reviews um, it's usually pretty obvious if you read through them all, all these five-star reviews. I think there's a real red flag to me and that is time, okay? So if you go in for a procedure and that practitioner, practitioner does not sit down and spend some time with you, there's something wrong. And that's, um, I mean, it sounds very vague, but you need time as a practitioner to get to know that person, to understand why they're there, what their expectations are. If I can't meet someone's expectations, there's an unhappy patient full stop. It doesn't matter whether it was successful or not. If that person thought they were going to get something different or thought you were going to achieve something different, then they're not going to be happy. Whether I think I'm brilliant or not, they won't be. So in order to meet someone's expectations, I really need to know what their expectations are. I need to know where they got them from. That's really interesting. I like that. Wow. I need to know why they're really doing it. Is it because they're worried their husband's going to leave them? Is there, are they worried that their friends are doing, you know, better than them or are more successful? Are they, you know, looking at social status? Are they just feeling a bit down in themselves? Are they just, someone that appreciates how good you can feel when you look good, you feel good. And it's all about them. And just like buying a nice dress and putting it on, you feel amazing. Cosmetic procedures should be like that. We can, we should be able to do it for ourselves, feel good, look good, feel better, 
and so on. But you don't know that unless you explore it. And, you know, the, there are red flags like body dysmorphic disorder and these things that we're taught about to look for. But, you know, that's just one end of the spectrum. There's also this big spectrum of you need to actually know your patient as well. And you need to know, in my opinion, whether it's a laser, fat reduction, Botox, fillers, um, you need to really understand what they're there for and what they expect to get out of it. Because just because you get rid of their frown lines doesn't mean that you've actually fixed what their problem was that they came in with, if, if that's what, even if that's what they asked for. You know, I can have a patient, they come in and say, I just want some Botox for my frown line. I've had it before, didn't have any problems. It was fine. Now, I mean, I could do that in 30 seconds. Okay, good. No contraindications. You're not pregnant. Let's go. Or I could spend 30 minutes with them and work out really, is that, is that really what they need? Are they treating their frown lines because they think they look tired all the time because they're, you know, the boyfriend said you're is. always angry. Why are you looking at me like that? Is it because they're going for a new job and they want to look younger than the people they're competing against? Like there's all these reasons behind even why someone might get their frown lines treated. And if you don't know that, then you're not doing the best thing for your patient, in my opinion. And so number one is, are they spending a bit of time with you? Number two is, you know, have they explained all the side effects that hopefully you can Google as well? And, and you want to make sure that there's an honest conversation there. Because first of all, we know complications happen. We know most things have a, a risk. And so what is that risk? Have they experienced it? Um, if they haven't experienced it, is it because they haven't done it that much? So, or is it because they're not telling you, or is it because they're actually really, really good and they and don't get those complications? Who has the guts to ask their doctor that? Now, I want well, to. I, this is you know, thing. I want to play devil's advocate on behalf of the consumer. Nobody does, and very few people. I mean, occasionally people say to me, "Do you, have you done this before, or do you do this much?" And I mean, I can say whatever I want, right? Could be the first first time I did it. And I'm like, yeah, all the time, whatever. But if I said to that person, um, so, you know, have you ever had this complication? They say, no, look, it's rare. You know, I, I know people that have. What Then you want to ask, what would you do if I did have that complication? That's my number one question. Second question, time. And then what would you do? So, um, if they say, well, you know, we would treat it with this, this is the process, that's why I'm consenting you to the treatment for aftercare as well. Um, you know, you would have to have liposuction if this complication happened. You know, that's not covered by my clinic or, you know, that would be at your own cost. This is the option. If you're not sure, you could try this first. These are the other options available. You know, you want, you want people to give you options. I actually think um, giving you options, not just people always say, you know, they want their practitioner to listen and do what they tell them. You know, people say, I want my practitioner to listen to me and do what I ask them to do. But on the other hand, if you go in and say, I want my lips done and they just do it, that's not always your, in your best interest either. So, so long as that practitioner explores that that is the best option for you and says, well, I'm happy to do your lips, but they're going to look out of balance with your face. And if you want them done, I would suggest X, Y, Z instead or as well. Um, I mean, there are a few little tips, but it's very, very hard for people to know, to know. It and that's where trust nice. and recommendations are really good if you can find one. So just to go back and finish up on how we started this conversation, what are Linda Evangelista's options to treat? And, um, you know, as we were talking about, what, what, what are her options now? Well, so in most cases, um, this is a procedure that's done on localised problem areas. Okay, so most people who have it done uh, would say, I've got a double chin, I'm not overweight, it annoys me, or I've got love handles, I'm not really overweight. So generally the procedure is recommended for people who are not overweight and have problem areas that are not so much amenable to 
um, overall fat reduction, so weight loss. So the problem for Linda, in my understanding, is that she had many areas of the body all treated at once and so had very widespread problems. And that in itself makes you think, well, why did she have so many areas treated? Was that someone I, When I think a... about my treatment and I think imagine having, it, it's, it's not like drinking water. It is a procedure. It's still mm -hmm. quite heavy and you brew. And, you, and know, it... you can see it though. You know, she's famous and she's um, well known. She's probably experiencing some aging signs that many people do, which often can include, you know, double chin if that's your genetic tendency and other areas of fat. And she's probably not wanting to do a surgical procedure because she doesn't want the downtime, doesn't want to be recognised, doesn't want to be in a hospital. But I'm just all shocked how they manage to do multiple procedures in one go. I mean, it's quite heavy duty. Like yeah. Going back to the consenting and, and responsible care, it seems a pretty irresponsible thing to have done. <laughs> it seems exactly. And that's my point. Like I... You know, I, as I said, again, I'm not across the details of the case, but my understanding is that she is um, suing the manufacturers. And if they were withholding information about that device, which I, I believe at that point in time, it was, it was out and known. So, you know, that's one question, obviously, for the courts. Then the question is her practitioners, did they were they completely unaware of that or did they omit it from her consenting? And why did they treat such huge, like widespread areas of her? You know, because in most people that wouldn't be appropriate because if you need every area of your body treated. Perhaps this is not the treatment areas, for you. <laughs> then you probably, you're not choosing the right option really. Mm. And, I mean, you always have to wonder about, again, did they go, well, here's a rich supermodel and we can treat 20 areas and make loads of money off it? I mean, you just don't know. I'm not saying that's how what they do. How can she fix it? Can she fix it? Is, are there options Well, in her? most cases, most cases, liposuction is the best treatment option. It needs to be delayed because initially the fat is quite hard. And so um, that's because it's inflamed and well, growing. she's saying she's been a, a recluse for five years as a result. So mm. the delay time has so passed. So the, the details that I have seen um, suggested that, she had, she, that she'd had some corrective procedures that failed. Oh, um, I did see somewhere that she'd uh, had a scarring response to her liposuction. So developed scarring, um, which, worse. you know, it's just disaster on disaster, complication on complication. and Trauma after trauma, if you really want to talk Trauma after about trauma, it. exactly. Yeah. And I'm not surprised, you know, she's in a bad way mentally, absolutely. Whose fault it is, it's, I can't say that, yeah, of course. Yeah, right. that's not the um, today's conversation is about. How do we avoid having something that we don't want yeah. happen to us in a world where we, you know, we do want multiple treatments and we want quick treatments and we want treatments provided by caring, educated, well-trained, um, you know, empathetic practitioners. You know, it's, mm. I think your advice has been fantastic today. It's really difficult because I think at the core of it, any one of us, and I've thought exactly this, who um, chooses to go undergo elective cosmetic procedures have this sort of feeling of shame or vanity you know it's I mean don't get me wrong like I'm for I'm I specialize in vanity I'm all for it but it's um it's still questioned sometimes you question it yourself and to me it's because I'm like well if this goes wrong if I do something that stuffs up here especially on myself you know how much of an idiot will I look Really, I mean, I'll look pretty silly because I'm choosing to have it done and it's all about how I look, right? So who have you got to blame other than yourself? And that's a thought process that I think you'd be surprised if, if someone hadn't had. And that's where you can see, I think, the snowball effect and why she's probably had so many difficulties because at the end of the day, you have had these terrible complications. I don't deny that, but she chose to get it done. Mm -hmm. And she either wasn't consented or she didn't listen or she didn't do her research or all of the above mm. or people weren't aware of it. Mm. But 
it's very hard not to blame yourself and I'm sure she has been and from even from her statement it sounds like she feels like if she takes action then it will take stop her hating herself for it as much but I think a lot of the time it's hating yourself for making the wrong choice going to the wrong person doing something that you know you thought was a quick fix or whatever Mm. um and I think that's where you know good on her to to try and move on come out say what it is I mean she's obviously been afraid to even show her face because she looks different and um if this makes her um be able to move on then I'm all for it you know and and at the end of the day that's why we all have insurance because the we uh, being we are the doctors. responsible yes. somewhat. The we and being the doctors who have insurance. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, medical practitioners. And if she can prove that they were negligent, go for it. Go for it. You know, if if that's if if a court of law agrees, then that's her right to do that. And um you know, I'd actually say the same person, same thing to one of my patients if if they had a serious complication, you know. Um, well uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss not only what happened to Linda Evangelista but also some of the steps that we can take in making sure that whatever procedure we're having is the right procedure is being performed by the right person uh, we've chosen uh, we understand the risk and um, the aftercare that needs to happen I think it's such a big conversation and I, I was as I said at the beginning uh, of the episode, I was really um, impressed and touched by the way that you were um, explaining it to your followers on social media. And I had seen a couple of other doctors who took a very different approach and I was quite shocked. So um, I wanted to get you on the show sooner than I'd anticipated. And I I (laughs) want to thank you so much for being on Ageless by Rescue. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode and if you did, please share and rate this episode. I'd love that.